seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Howdy, Croc Nation. Dr. Tommy and Ellie here with you with another Croc podcast. Angel, I am as pleased as punch today. We have a guest guest today, and it's going to be a wonderful podcast. Uh, but for reasons that may seem a little vague at first, but we'll clear things up. What are your thoughts? Well, my thoughts are I'm excited be- like everyone else, because quite honestly, I have no idea what we're going to be talking about. But I know that anytime you bring a guest, they are special. They are important and inspiring. So with that being said, let's go. You always say the right words because it's going to be one of those kinds of podcasts. So it'll be... Um... You know, there'll be uh, tissues and tears, but laughter and uh, inspiration for sure. And um, today's podcast is really a life celebration of a friend of mine and a great man. And more importantly, or just as importantly, I should say, um, a tribute to his amazing wife. Um, And this is going to be a love story, a love story of James and Teresa. So on June 29th of this year, a bright light went dim in the universe After a three-year battle with an aggressive cancer, my friend and my patient, James, left this world for one better. Yet today's podcast is not at all to be thought of as a tale of sadness or a tale of defeat, but on the contrary, today's podcast is to tell a tale of victory and to tell a tale of inspiration. James' short but impactful life epitomizes, in my opinion, the famous inspirational quote, in the end, it's not the years in your life that counts. It's the years, I'm sorry, it's the life in your years. And I believe that James really had a very full life in the short life that he had. Um, Basically, the story starts when I first met Teresa and James um, in 2021, after noticing uh, a weight loss Um, You know, James kind of kept it under his hat, but one day he kind of flicked his hand and his wedding ring flew off and his wife, who was a nurse, said, buddy, that's it. We're going to get this looked at. And that was the start of uh, his battle uh, with his cancer. And that's when I first met him and Teresa and Angel, you know this as well as anybody. Teresa, you will learn this. Well, you probably know this about me. I really take a lot of pride in getting to know um, all of my patients at a very deep level, not just as a patient, but as human beings. And, and I really try to get deep. But people, especially survivors, are very, very deep and complex with many textures and many layers I like to say, since we're in the Hudson Valley near the black dirt farms, I like to say um, survivors are like onions. Um, There's many, many layers to them. And I think that when you continue to try to peel each layer, you get a deeper sense of who it is that you're taking care of. And I really believe that I thought that I knew James and Teresa very well, but I wasn't even close. I I was not even close to knowing who they actually were as people. And I think today's podcast um, will uh, identify who he was and who she is. Um, So as I mentioned, James left us in June. And just last week, uh, Teresa gave me a call and she asked me if I was going to be in the office. Um, She wanted to drop something off. And I thought, yeah, you know, I'm in the office. Sure, I didn't think much of it. And you have to understand, guys, that, you know, in a 35 year career, I may have received thousands of kind and thoughtful and generous and special um, expressions of people's appreciation. But I don't think Angel anything could have prepared me um, for what I received when Teresa came in and all the nurses were together and we were all hugging Teresa and wishing her our best. And she uh, presented to me this sort of wrapped, you know, what was a picture. And I can only tell you that when I opened it, I couldn't believe what I saw because what I saw was something that was made by James when he was ill, and it represented such a level of of artistic creation and and, um, aptitude that I didn't know anything about that um, from him. And imagine him doing this intricate drawing of me as a superhero, you know, during the days when he was really sick, 
And by the way, he couldn't, he didn't have use of one of his arms um, because his arm was involved with the cancer, which fractured and he never gained use of that arm again. So you can imagine what he had to do to make this picture. And we'll have this on the website, but I just want to kind of describe it um, because it really has touched me so deeply, you know, um, that I really, there are no words, but I'll try to, you know, I'll try to identify it or describe it to the best of my ability. Um, so it starts in this room, which is basically black with stars all around the room. And emanating from the stars are sort of these green sort of streaks of energy, this emerald energy. And then there's a linear accelerator or an x-ray machine in the background. And then there's me um, standing in front of this accelerator, looking pretty damn good, if you want to know the truth. I don't think I really look that good in real life, but he made me look really good. And I have this, like... I have hair, number one, right? I have hair and the hair is blonde and it's being sort of pushed over to the side, you know, like in one of those anime cartoons. And I'm wearing a jersey, right? This really cool jersey uh, with my name on it. And then they, he even, he was very kind. He put a small little belly pouch, but nothing too much, like not in real life. I, I wish I looked as thin as, as this guy does. And, um, and, you know, of course, disheveled, uh, he even represented my jeans. I wear these khaki jeans or these Levi jeans. They're all wrinkled all the time and they're all kind of all over the place. And she goes all the way down to my, um, low dunk, um, sneakers that I'm wearing. But the most important and striking thing of the picture, um, are in my hands. I have my hands up and I have these two energy emerald energy sources in my hand, uh, I guess, representing like a cancer curing, you know, modality, my accelerator. And, 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 and I saw this and like, I just was in shock. Like I know Teresa and we're going to have you um, speak in a minute, but I, I think you might've thought that like, I didn't really think much of it um, because I didn't really say anything, but it wasn't because I didn't think much of it. It was quite the opposite. It was because I was just overcome, like with just such a surge of emotion about this great man and his life and 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 all those types of things. And I have to tell you, what an inspiration. And thank you for coming on the podcast. Uh, welcome. Thank you. So, um, Angel, um, when I sent you the picture last week, um, unbelievable, right? You know, I gotta be honest, you know, I, I, because I didn't have the background, I really didn't know, you know, what it was. It it was very intriguing, very well done. I mean, I am no, uh, art, uh, you know, curator or, uh, a person that can the, the dissect what's amazing and what's not, but by far it is a, a very well, uh, drawn out picture. But now knowing the reasoning behind it, um, it, it just really emphasizes the amount of respect and admiration and the way he saw you as his superhero. Um, really, really, uh, if one picture can, uh, what's that expression? One picture can say a thousand words and we've pretty much nailed about a million. Yeah, and, and I want to tell you is that when I got that, it took me a few days, but but I called Teresa back and I said, all right, Teresa, we're going to do a podcast on this. This is just too, too good and it's too important and we really need to honor this guy. But before we do that, I need to peel all those layers off. So I need to know everything about this guy and I need to know everything about you. Um, so we had about a 45 minute conversation and I really... Um, there's a couple of things. I mean, we could literally make this podcast into hours, but but there were three things that I want to have Teresa speak to, and we'll go nice and slow and one at a time. And Teresa, to the same level of detail that you gave me, um, I want to, number one, know about you, right? So actually four things. We're going to get to know you a little bit. And number two is we're going to talk about the day that you met in New Paltz at that pub at, at college. Um, and then I was really, really um, so, um, 
I keep using the word overcome and I apologize. I should know a better word, but it, it's all that comes to my mind about how you and Jim kept your lives as normal as you did for the, you know, for yourselves and for the children, but how a person could do that. And that's going to be one of the lessons for our survivors today is when you feel that the whole world is just falling apart, how you can achieve that amount of energy and courage to not only just get out of bed, but to raise your family and go to work and try to stay as normal as possible. And then the last thing that struck me is I want to hear about, you know, I'll call it a hidden artist. So Jim, who is an artist, uh, clearly an artist, but never pursued that for many personal reasons. And I'm going to get that to that as well. But first, I want to know about Teresa. Angel wants to know about you as well. Pretend you never talked to Angel because you never did. Um, tell him about you and what is your essence and uh, you as a person. Okay, so I'm going to go back to the 90s. I graduated high school. I went off to college. I went to SUNY Morrisville, had no idea what I wanted to do. So I had always ridden horses. I was like, great, I'm going to become a horse trainer. So I went off for equine science. My very first winter up by Syracuse, we got this snowstorm. It was freezing cold. We couldn't get to the barn. I was like, well, this isn't for me. So I started changing my majors. I started partying, I kind of flunked out, <laughs> came back home and went to Sullivan County Community College. I did a semester of liberal arts and I was looking through the college catalog one day and I'm like, oh, look, nursing. I haven't tried that one yet. <laughs> so I went and I talked to the, the nursing staff and I got accepted into their program. And while I was doing some of my prereq classes, we had microbiology. And there were some others, just science kids in there. We became friends with this one kid named Chester. And he was one of our lab partners. And one day after class, he's like, oh, my friend is meeting me. I want you to meet him. So we got introduced. And looking back on this, it was James. So our paths crossed. Didn't, you know, hi, how are you? Nice to meet you. That was it. We went our separate separate ways. Then in 2005, I was working on my bachelor's degree and it was a lecture that I had already heard. And I had been a nurse now for four years. I was working at Catskill Regional. I was a med surge, peds nurse. I had been taking oncology classes. I was floating over to do outpatient oncology with chemo. And my friend and I slipped out and went to the bar to have some dinner. And we were there for about an hour eating some pasta with seafood on top. It was like an Alfredo scampi thing. I don't even remember, but it was really good. And I heard the door open and I turned my head to the left. And in walks a friend from high school and this guy. And it was like a feeling like I've never had. And I'll probably never have this feeling again. But it was like two worlds had collided. Like this was the guy that I was supposed to be with. And it took us about a half an hour. And then we finally started talking, exchanged phone numbers. And from that September day in 2004 until June 29th, we were inseparable. And I mean, June 29th of this year, we were what? together for over 18 years. Wow. Wow. You just knew. In, and you also told me that he knew. He did. Right. He did. I think the question that er that begs to be asked is, did you share your dinner with him that night? No, I ate it all. <laughs> <laughs> Good for you. Good for you. That's what I want to hear. Um, so now you guys are together. You have these two beautiful children. I've now I've met just met Alex on the on the podcast, and I know Charlotte. She came yep. with you to deliver the the painting. Um, 
you know, you guys are working your butts off, you're, you know, living a normal life. Like, you know, I asked you where you guys would go on vacation. You said no vacation. You know, we raised our kids. We worked two jobs. We did what we had to do. We held each other up and it was enough. It was fun. You guys did your little routines, your little traditions. Life was great. And now we're getting into probably the beginning of 2021. Um, you start noticing, well, he starts losing weight at first. You probably don't notice. And then you start noticing, but you don't say anything. Yeah. Then the day of the ring, um, when his ring comes off and you said, buddy, that's it. Um, mm -hmm. you, took, you took charge as a nurse and as a wife. And, and that's what you did. And um, I guess what my question is, because I really don't want this podcast to be about um, his cancer journey. I want it to be about his life journey. And what I want it to emphasize is how remarkable. And remember, I met him in the beginning when it first started, but then I also kind of reconnected with you guys after the surgery when the tumor had metastasized and I was kind of taking on a different role rather than one of cure, one of trying to relieve pain and, and, and improve quality. Um, but there was zero difference um, that I saw from when I first met you when we were on a curative track um, to when I met you when when we knew the trajectory was not going to be curative. Um, can you kind of talk about that and kind of highlight, you know, maybe your life before the cancer and then how you try to retain that normalcy? Um, because I think many of our survivors, uh, you know, we treat, a, you know, hopefully this podcast has survivors in all stages. So we hope that everybody is curative and no one has to deal with having metastatic disease or being in, you know, end stage or whatever. Um, but the fact is there are, and I think what they would want to know and Angel and I to represent them uh, would want to ask is how you did what you did, because it was impossibly, it was, imp it seemed impossible from my silly life. You know, the littlest things bother me and this was really big potatoes. Um, so uh, let me let you comment on that. So one of the strangest things is the end of 2020, I ended up really spraining my ankle. So we had horses, we had chickens, we had bunnies, dogs, cats, ducks. We had this menagerie and I really sprained my ankle, tore my ligaments and everything. And I was out of work. So by the time my ankle was healed and I was ready to go back, the job that I was at kind of took my position away. They said I exceeded my FMLA. My position wasn't secure and they wanted me to work overnights. And I said, you know, I don't really want to do this overnight thing. I need to have a day job. And I had worked for hospice per diem prior to the pandemic starting. And with knowing that I was losing my, my day position, I called up my supervisor at hospice that I had gotten to know. And I said, Hey, Beth, do you still have any full-time positions open? I'd like to come back as a full-time hospice nurse. And she said, yes, definitely. I'll hire you right back. Put in your application. When can you start? So I started training. I became a full-time hospice RN case manager out in the community. And every time James and I would go out, people would be like, Oh, Teresa, what do you do? I'd say, well, I'm a hospice nurse. And I would always get the same response. Oh my gosh, that's got to be so hard. Why, why did you pick hospice? And I said, I don't know. It just came to me. And being that, you know, James was a union steam fitter. You always think, you know, construction workers and nurses, they're kind of this on the same level, you know? So him and I had gotten along great. And he's like, you know, if you want to do this hospice nurse thing, go ahead and do it. He says, you always were talking about it ever since we first got together. So lo and behold, it was January of that year that I was full time. I was in it. And then we got this diagnosis later on that year. So I think that set me up for how to handle work, family, and life. Um, some days with working hospice, there's, there's long hours, there's charting after work, you really become one with, with your families, with your patients. Everybody stays a piece of everybody is always in my heart. And 
once we got that diagnosis of cancer, I went through every emotion. The biggest one was this pre-grief where, oh my gosh, my husband has cancer. He's 43. What if we can't cure this? What if I lose him? What are my kids going to do? What am I going to do? And it was really hard. But he was always so strong and wouldn't or didn't say he was in pain. He would try to hide the nausea. He would say, I'm fine. He would be out there chopping wood back in right before he died in the begin end of April this year. He was out there splitting wood. He had metastasis to the bone, the lung, out of breath. And he's out there using lung splitter the best he can to try and get me ready for the winter just in case. So with my nursing experience and his strength, we still got Charlotte to soccer practice. We still got Alex's driver's license, got him a car, got the car fixed. I've been working on my bachelor's degree right on through this. I was taking classes. He was still making dinner. He loved to cook. Right before he got diagnosed, he got accepted into the Culinary Institute of America. And then he picked up a sketch pad one day and he just started drawing. And I looked over, I'm like, wow, I'm like, that's really good. He's like, do you really think so? I'm like, yeah. He's like, well, back when I was younger, when I was a teenager, I had all these sketchbooks and my mom would always tell me that they were terrible. I was drawing demons. I was going to go to hell. I would, and he would collect these comic books. He loved Batman and he would collect these Spider-Mans and she wouldn't let him have any of those when he moved out because those were evil books. So he kind of put down the pen and the pencils and the sketchbook until he got cancer. And he's like, well, I never got to do some of the things that I wanted to do. Maybe I'll try this again. And he even started developing his own characters for his own comic book, which I have the pictures and someday I'll share them. But for right now, they're, they're secret and they're under lock and key. But he always wanted to go down to Comic-Con and try to find Todd McFarlane and have him look at his drawings to see if he was any good. In my heart, I know he's good. These pictures that he draws, there's such vivid colors and such detail. It's just, it's, it's it's amazing. And that was his outlet during his cancer treatments. He would sit there while getting chemo and he would sketch. And I'm just glad that someday I'll be able to share that. And he always wanted a piece of him to go on, even if he wasn't here. Well, that's going to happen because uh, he is on my wall and he will be always on my wall and he will always be in my heart as you are. So the way Angel and I usually run our podcast is we go through a series of questions and go through a series of provocative situations. And then at the end, we try to tie it up with a nice, uh, beautiful survivorship bow and ribbon. And that's what we're going to do today. So we had four things that we wanted to achieve today. Number one is we wanted to honor a great person. And I think that we achieved that angel uh, without a doubt. And number two is we wanted to distill some important lessons for our survivors that they could learn from Jim and from Teresa and from these two heroes. And one of them is when everything is falling apart um, as a person, individually, as a partner, um, as a parent or as a friend, um, know that each of us, even if you're not a hospice nurse or even if you don't have a strong constitution like Jim did, um, you, there is strength within you and giving you the ability to try to stay as normal as possible, even when normal seems impossible. And I think that's one of the secrets for survivors is to be able to try to achieve um, that superpower, which Jim and Teresa did. Um, number three, and this is for you, Teresa, the caretaker 
caregiver partners are always the unsung heroes. So they are sort of the unmasked superhero, the ones that are never identified. Their works are there and available to view, but sometimes no one knows who does them. Um, we all have a little bit of an underlying comic book theme going on today. And I know Teresa's favorite character is the Hulk. I know Angel's is Superman. I know Jim's was Batman. Um, I'm still not sure who mine is. I tend to be a little bit more on the Spider-Man side. Um, but I will tell you things are changing to going toward Green Lantern. But in any case, um, I want to just say thank you to you, Teresa, and what you represent. You know, you represent, you know, a lot of times we emphasize our survivors and the people suffering from cancer. Uh, and sometimes we ignore the people that are suffering just as much, maybe not physically, maybe not viscerally, but certainly emotionally and spiritually and uh, the pain and suffering that you're going through. And now you have to take on a new role. You have to basically raise your children alone and you have to, you know, go through all the ups and the ebbs and the flows of life, you know, without that great man that we're honoring today. So I wanted to make sure that that was one of our bullet points of what we were trying to, to do is not just honor Jim, but also to honor you. And then lastly, and I think probably as important as the other three bullet points is how important it is for you survivors, um, especially, you know, uh, during this part of your life um, to live your best life, to be you, to live your dreams and to tackle your aspirations and to express your unique amazingness, even if there are people trying to snuff out your dream or to try to uh, make fun of you or try to limit you or feel threatened by you or have their own opinions about what you want to do. Um, we want you to try to fight through that influence and really feel that you're expressing yourself um, to the best of your ability. And last but not least, to our practitioners out there who have the honor and privilege of not only getting to treat people like Teresa and Jim, but also to become deeply involved and friends with them. I want you to never stop peeling back that onion. Uh, never stop getting to know who your patients really are. Never stop digging and deepening your friendship with your survivors. Instead, let them enchant you. Let them inspire you. Let them teach you. Let them surprise you. Just as I was surprised when I opened the picture that was lovingly given to me by Teresa and from her daughter. Angel, you always get the last word. You know, I think that um, today's um, love story um, is another great example of how perfect um, these two individuals um, were truly soulmates. Um, understanding the story um, for an individual that two individuals have never met until today, um, it really put into perspective that, you know, the big guy upstairs doesn't make mistakes. Um, he puts people at the right place at the right time for a purpose. We go back to the moment these two laid eyes on each other, to the moments of uncertainty in what she was not sure of her future was going to be, but knew that when she laid eyes on this beautiful soul knew that that was the person that was going to be a part of her life. We, we, in my, in my field and what I do on a personal level, we do not mourn when someone has left us. We celebrate their life. We celebrate what they bring to so many people all over the world. What Jim has brought out of, um, out of this is, what I bullet pointed for myself, which was number one, two awesome children. His legacy will live on. His drawing or drawings that eventually will be unlocked will also be an inspiration. And more importantly, his commitment and love as a husband, as a father 
will always, always persevere and be in the heart of Teresa, who will continue on in her journey that, quite honestly, he helped put her in and supported her. And now she gets to do what she does best in being there for so many people and having the strength and the ability to share in so many other people's unfortunate miseries, but she will have the ability to share with them the treasure that Jim has provided her. And I like to end with saying to Teresa, which I'm sure you already know, he may not have, he may, may not be here in, you know, um, in the front of our eyes. He is here in spirit. He is in your heart. He is in the heart of your children. Every time they smile, every time they laugh, there is a piece of him because of both of you. So I am honored and truly blessed to have heard this story. And I am even more honored that when I go see Dr. Inali, I will be able to see that drawing and really understand the love and the commitment that he had for every single person that listens to today's episode. So on behalf of myself, thank you. God bless you. And keep up the amazing work. I will. Thank you. Angel, there's nothing I could say that that there are no words. You said it beautifully. So we will end by, again, telling our survivors um, to join us in this tribute um, to Teresa and Jim. It is a love story. And there are many lessons that we hope that you bring home. Those days where you feel you don't have it in you, where you feel that it's just too much, when you feel that there's just too much pain and there's not enough hope, uh, know that there are people who have done it before you and have done it as good as it could be done. And that's what you're looking to try to emulate that exact story. And of course, on behalf of, I'm gonna say today a little differently, on behalf of Jim and Teresa, everyone here at the Croc Podcast wishes all of our survivors a long, healthy, happy, and cancer-free life. May God bless you. May God be with you. Peace. Peace.